Okay, first of all, I'm not a chef, so I appreciate being called a chef, but I'm not a chef, but I do make soup. I'm going to start with a squash soup, and as that's going, I'm going to start a potato leek soup. And we'll just go from there. The idea is I'm going to get it in the pot cooking, and then we're going to switch over to Jerry, who's going to do the bread, and then we're going to come back to me for finishing off of the soup. Um, the, it is Both soups are low cost. They're hearty meals, and most of the vegetables have come from my own garden, which is why my potatoes are browning so quickly. So uh, anyways, I'm going to get, I'm going to start and pardon me if I have my back to you, I'm going to do my best to remember to face the camera, but cooking two soups in 10 minutes is going to be an interesting concept. So stay tuned. Oh, you have a gas stove. Wow. I know, but this, the pilot light doesn't work on this one. Oh. <laughs> Nor does that lighter so stay t it's my pet peeve <laughs> i've totally missed having a gas stove i used to have one when i was in new york and so now it's all electric and you have to totally adapt like, yeah you know, exactly do it okay so we're starting i'm just putting some butter in both pots so this is the squash soup and this is the potato and it's i'm not good on measuring but it's soup so the nice thing about soup you don't need to measure but it's about a tablespoon so we're going to melt that down. So for the squash soup, I'm waiting for my butter to melt and then I'm going to add onions. I'm going to let them soften for a couple minutes and then I'm going to add the garlic and the curry powder. Curry powder needs to heat up to release all the flavors. That's going to cook for five minutes in the leek soup, potato and leek soup. I'm gonna melt the butter. I'm gonna fry up the onion. Oh, actually I'm gonna fry up the bacon and the onions. And then once they're done, then we'll move on. But kind of, I'm just gonna jump between both pots. They are uh, gluten-free. My son is celiac. So everything we cook in the house is gluten-free. They're not necessarily vegetarian or actually the this well no they're not vegetarian my broth is a vegetable broth for this one uh, chicken stock for this one and they're not we do put cream in both but they can you can omit the cream it, it just makes it richer but it's not necessary so they can be lactose free and gluten free and if you want they can be a vegetarian as well so I'm just heating up the onions and in just a minute or two I will add the curry powder and I will so the recipes will be sent out to everyone so we're going to add a pinch of chili flakes hot chili flakes and obviously you can spice it up based on what you like Potato leek, I'm adding the bacon. And the onions. And they're just gonna soften up. We want the bacon to kind of brown a little bit. I did wash my hands beforehand. So this is, I don't know if you can see it. Yep. Uh, well, you can see the potatoes have already started to go brown. And I'm just gonna point out that is the difference between homegrown and store-bought. Hmm. For, for homegrown potatoes, organic, they, you cannot get them ready the day before. It doesn't work. I don't know what they do to potatoes in our stores or in the, the what the farms do to keep them, but a homegrown potato will go brown within half an hour. Mm. I know, it's crazy. Okay, so I'm gonna add um, half a teaspoon of yellow curry powder to this and just cook it a little bit just to get the aroma from the curry. 
And then I've got one crushed garlic clove. And I crush it over mincing it because then it doesn't burn. It won't, um, well, hopefully it won't burn. This pot is a hot pot, so it may burn, but that's all right. It's Why is it less likely to burn? Pardon me? Why is it less likely to burn? Because it's bigger. If you mince it, it's smaller bits and they'll, oh. it'll just cook faster. Got it. This was my grandmother's pot. I love it, but it gets, once it's hot, it's too hot. Yeah. Oh, we have a question. Um, do you just use regular bacon or special bacon? I use regular bacon, whatever. I don't do the shopping in the house, so whatever my husband buys. But you can omit it. It, it doesn't even, I mean, it can be omitted. Okay, I'm going to add the squash now just simply because I'm starting to burn my pot. And this is from my garden, the squash. Nice. So now I'm going to add to that. I'm going to So here I have chicken stock and uh, 900 milliliters of chicken stock in a cup of water. And then I'm going to add to that, I am going to add some nutmeg. Quarter of a teaspoon. And then these are really simple recipes, which is why I chose them for tonight. And now we're just going to bring it to a boil. And then once it's come to a boil, um, we're just going to put the lid on and we're going to cook it. It takes 30 minutes, but I cut the squash pretty small, so it shouldn't take too long. And that's two and a half pounds of squash, of uh, butternut squash. So they were about that big, two of them. And then, so right now I'm frying up the onions and the bacon, and then I'm going to add the leek. And I ate all ours, so I had to buy them, which really hurt. So the leeks, you only use the white part and then about an inch of the lighter green part. I mean, that's probably wasteful, and I'm sure other people will find ways to use all of it. But generally speaking, that's all I use. And that was, it's 400 grams. So, I don't know, just under a pound. And it was three leeks. And they are a root vegetable that are really inexpensive. Actually, both of these meals are very inexpensive to make and flavorful. Why do you, only, why do you use mainly the, the bottom parts then, the roots and the not? They're tough. They're, they're tougher, they're dirtier, mm -hmm. and they're just not as, uh, the flavor I think is, Jerry may know better, but the flavor is in the white, it's in the soft. It's kind of like a green onion. Okay. Like, so I know um, we have a, well, my husband's British. We had a family living with us for over a year and they don't even use the green parts of a green onion. Mm. They, they're just considered waste. I, I don't, I use it, but it's kind of the same premise. Okay, so the, I don't know if you can see it, but anyways, the bacon and the onions are cooking. My pot is going brown. Good news is I don't do dishes in the house if I cook. So I think the cleanup crew will come in later. So, so right now I had put butter in. There's also the, the fat from the bacon. So there's just, you know, there's enough in there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to dump my potatoes in that are slightly brown. And I'm going to put my leeks in. And I'm going to turn it down just because what they're going to do now is I'm going to, I'm not adding the stock yet. I'm going to let them come up, oh, come up to temperature. I'm going to put the lid on and I'm going to, for five minutes, I'm going to let them get hot. I'm going to shake it to make sure they're not sticking. 
And then following that, I'll add my broth. So the broth used for this one is a vegetable stock. Again, it's gluten-free because not all stocks are gluten-free. Uh, so we're going to add uh, one and a half liters of stock or uh, six cups of stock. And then that's going to cook for about 20 minutes and then it's done. So we've got half an hour for this one, although it won't take half an hour. And then we've got 20. So Jerry, you need to really extend out your demonstration because <laughs> I need at least 20 minutes to finish these soups. Um, but that's it. I mean, there's hardly any ingredients in the potato leek soup, right? There's like butter, bacon, potatoes, stock, and leeks, five ingredients. And they're all root vegetables, low cost, and then almost the same for the squash. And then as a finisher, we add whipping cream, but even that's optional. It doesn't have to happen. Okay, so I can keep going. We can just, we can chat while we wait for my potatoes to get ready for the for the um for the stock or you can go over to jerry oh whoops hold on there we go um i was just washing my hands so i put myself on mute for a second do you, oh, okay. do you make your own stock julie i i do but yeah. i didn't hear oh, okay yeah i've done um i haven't done chicken but i do beef so if we ever have prime rib or we do ribs I freeze them and then I'll cook them for two days in the crock pot. Mm -hmm. And then we, and then I just freeze it. I got an uh, Instapot or actually it's Crock-Pot Instapot. So we always speak with brand names. So mm -hmm. Crock-Pot um, is the same thing as an Instapot, but it's made by Crock, which is a brand name. And mm -hmm. that's the only thing my soups are. It's, the, it's one thing that I just can't wrap my head around. They always taste like weak, sort of salty, yucky, half cooked things. I just can't do it until I got my Instapot then. And now I make my own stock because you know, there's some, um, mm. so often like you get these vegetables that are just like, you know, ha almost ready to go in your fridge, but there's too many of them to eat, throw them in the stock pot, ready in half an hour, it's awesome. Yeah. So I got given the task of beer bread. And as Adelaide mentioned, when we started, beer bread is, um, there was a lack of yeast. And so, uh, you know, we are noticing all sorts of things in this pandemic that we run out of. Orzo is one thing. Appar apparently there's a worldwide shortage of orzo. Who even thought? Who even uses that or knows what it is? There's so many people cooking bread. And on my Facebook, all I ever see is um, sourdough, 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 and people make their own sourdough starter. There's all sorts of tricks and stuff like that. And so that's too hard for me. I'm going to just go buy bread if I need to. This lights maybe a little too much. So I'm just going to go buy bread if I, I'm not going to make it. I used to make it when the kids were little. I had this kind of um, fantasy that I was like, you know, the ultimate mother. So I would make bread from scratch. So every Saturday I would make bread from scratch. And I really liked it, but it was always yeast. Uh, bread and then people would eat it like by Saturday afternoon so it seemed like an awful lot of work to <laughs> uh, to make bread but this stuff I tried it last night and I thought this is the easiest thing I've ever done um beer bread so the recipe I put my flour in already there's three cups of just white flour and so um some recipes will call for bread flour um but my understanding is that Canadian flour can all be used as bread flour. That it's that that's a term that is for other uh, parts of the world that our flour has enough gluten in it to make it bread flour. So I just use all purpose. This one calls for all purpose and uh, that's fine. So three tablespoons of sugar, again, just white sugar. So stuff that people have in their, their cupboards already and then um, it calls for three teaspoons, but I'm going to send it out with the actual, with the way I would do it, because three tablespoons and one, three teaspoons and one tablespoon is exactly the same thing. So I don't know why the recipe calls for three teaspoons, but one tablespoon baking powder. Again, these are things that we have in our cupboards already, uh, usually for no apparent reason if you're not a cook, but. Um, and then a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. 
sorry, half a teaspoon of salt. You can just use regular salt. We buy it in bulk and stick it in whatever glass container happens to be in our cupboard. So it looks like this is fancy uh, sea salt, but it's not, it's just regular salt. And then I, some recipes will call for you to sift these things together. Um, I just use a whisk and it works just fine. So if you want to add, uh, it was an interesting point that Julie was making about um, green onions because green onions could be added to this as well. It just gives it a little bit more color. Um, and the tops of the green onions are not actually that flavorful. So it will just give you a little bit of color and won't change the consistency. I didn't think of that until we saw leek, uh, leek soup. So this one, I just made cheese, cheddar cheese, um, grated. You can use as much with cheese. You can kind of use as much as you want to use. Uh, you want to have enough to give it some color, some flavor, but it doesn't really change the consistency of the bread at all. And so when you're adding an ingredient to a flour dish, um, and this will happen like if you're adding uh, chocolate chips or anything like that, uh, you want to make sure that you add it so that the flour coats it um, and then it holds its integrity a bit better in the product as opposed to sometimes it can clump together if you if it's not coated with flour to keep it apart. And then the thing that makes it rise is here. And I, when we planned to do this, I diligently was going to go and get some uh, beer from my friend's brewery. He owns Fraser Mills uh, Fermentation Company on St. John's in Port Moody, but I ran out of time because it's been a busy week this week. And so I'm using just regular old beer. It calls for um, 12 ounces, which of course the beer is all measured in uh, milliliters, milliliters, or milliliters, pardon me. So we spent some time figuring out whether I was going to have some leftover beer with I used a can, but I actually measured it out and it's not, it's one can. So get yourself some bigger cans and then you can have something in case you're stressed about uh, cooking. You can add, you can have a beer at, at the at end that can go into your into your um, beer or into your bread. So the interesting thing about beer bread, like uh, Adeline was mentioning about yeast, is that you can actually smell um, the yeast coming out of it. So you can actually smell where that leaven part comes from. It's, uh, um, you know, and you can smell the yeast. And I don't know how many people have ever done uh, any studies on beer, but of course everybody knows that craft uh, Brewing is a big thing right now in Port Moody. And so the interesting thing about beer is that it's one of the earliest uh, beverages that was made. And it used to be made very specifically, people didn't really know how it got to be beer. And so I learned this traveling in Portland where they have an awful lot of craft beer as well. Uh, so the monks that would make it, some of the, um, bacteria and uh, what have you in their beards would come off as they were making beer because they were oh. it. sounds super gross but there's alcohol in it so it was sterile um, but that's what actually flavored the beer was the unique yeast that they used in it that actually came from their normal flora so um, they, as far as I know they don't do that anymore um, but uh, brewing is a huge huge enterprise and uh, right now uh, there's a lot of support. It's a very inclusive community. The breweries have crossover uh, brewers that will amalgamate and collaborate on different beers and um, different than a wine community where uh, vin uh, vintners and winemakers are um, competitive and they're very, um, very much about the blend that they're making, the wine they're making. Um, beer makers are much more about what can we do with this product and how far, far can we push it. So they're also actually of interest to me anyways, um, is that uh, it's a very uh, friendly community for women. So even though uh, a lot of breweries you see and a lot of uh, places that you go, you think of if there's any kind of stereotyping, you would stereotype uh, beer with these, you know, bearded sort of hipster men, they actually are very, very good at including women. So they have uh, scholarships, they have fundraisers to put uh, female brewers through um, through Kwantlen uh, Brewery Program. And they actually have uh, 
craft brew shows that are only with uh, female brewers. So it's super interesting, super interesting, inclusive community. All which I've learned from my friend at uh, Fraser Mills Fermentation Company. So the recipe, you can put it into a bread, into a, a loaf, uh, but I was kind of lazy and wondered how it would, it would turn out if I just put it on a cooking shelf sheet and it worked. So to round up the, the top of the bread, you just melt some butter and like put it over top of the bread as much as you want. The recipe says two tablespoons. I'm not gonna measure out two tablespoons. I'm just gonna put it on. Stick it in the oven at 375 for about 50 minutes. And then it turns out like this. So I'll just show you like I cook this one for 50 minutes. So you can just see it's almost like a big, huge biscuit, really. And then if you open it, like it's just too bad you can't smell over the internet because like this smells amazing. Um, but you can just see how light uh, and airy it is. And it just like it's just the easiest, easiest thing. And you go to some you go to a potluck and you bring bread. People are going to think you're amazing. You brought home homemade bread with you. And it was like five minutes of preparation. It's, it's so great. So I'm looking at it for 50 minutes and over to you, Julie. All right. Well, thank you, Jerry. Um, interesting enough, that beer bread recipe that, that, that Jerry did actually came from Denise McIntosh, who did the last, um, the last session for us on Turkey Leftovers. She often posts recipes on her Facebook page. And uh, I have yet to be disappointed with with her uh, her recipes, so thank you. The other one, um, actually we have, I, when maybe when I send out the recipes, Jerry, I'll include those, because we actually had two beer recipes. Um, the other one was my daughter's that she cooked for us, and it was equally as good or better. Um, the nice thing about the one that, that Jerry did is you can actually adapt it. So rather than having a savory, bread you can use cinnamon and brown sugar and you can like layer it so you've got almost like a cinnamon bun in the middle um so you can play around with it it's it's pretty flexible yeah and you just you can also substitute um i think i'm going to pull around with this a bit different types of beer to give it a different texture mm. different flavor yeah with ales it's really about the carbonation you're yeah. looking for so yeah. again sweet bread you can use seven up if you wanted something that you know didn't have you don't have to worry about alcohol or, you know, an alcohol content in it because that all cooks off while it's cooking. But if you were really quite sensitive about that, you can use club soda if you want to. Or, you know, it's really soda bread. You're looking for that carbonation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and dark, the, the dark ales make a, make a really nice bread. Mm -hmm. The yeah. dark ales. Um, Jen, I did try a gluten-free one. My son was a really good sport and he ate it, yeah. <laughs> but it just, it just crumbled because you can use um, the beer. We, we use Corona, which has a really, really low, it's a rice beer. So it celiacs can have it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is some um, gluten-free beer available, but the bread, uh, the, the flour, it's a flour mix flour yeah without gluten it's really yeah um, so I think the last one I told you guys my husband is a chef and and um, the, my mom is a very thrifty cook and she her theory is that you can't be a good cook unless the people around you actually want to eat your food and that encourages you to get better and better and um, so she just and my father uh, really knew how to play that system because so he used to say she, he loved everything that she made and so <laughs> so of course uh, she was widowed and you know as kids we were like we hated everything she made except for one rib recipe and um, so then when my husband was we were just engaged and she had him some over for dinner so she made a, a roast and um, she made Yorkshire puddings but she used whole wheat flour oh no oh. And so as the new fiance, he's gamely like, these are really good. They were like little hockey pucks. And of course, he had to be nice enough to say, I'll have another, but she kind of burnt them. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, cooking with gluten-free flour is a really different trick. And there are some ways to do it. And I've been experimenting and actually made uh, pita breads. 
the other day that were mm. vegan and gluten free and they puffed up like real pita breads. But uh, oh wow, it's a little bit of a trick and yeah, it's uh, it's not with normal ingredients. So. Yeah, I I did master at one point. I borrowed a friend's uh, bread maker and I actually mastered an awesome awesome gluten free bread, but. I gave the, I gave the bread maker back and gave up and he doesn't eat bread anymore anyway. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, all about, it's all about protein and no carbs. So oh, it makes my life easier, <laughs> <laughs> which is why we have clean eating here apart from, well, we try anyways, whatever we do our bit. So uh, I'm just going to check and see, I think it's probably, we, maybe we can have a bit of discussion time or something. Cause I think I probably need another five minutes for this, but I'm going to check them. All, all your weight looking for is uh, the veg. Once the vegetables are soft, then we're good. But I'm sure, yeah, we're five minutes away on this one. I did have a question, Julie, about um, if if one were to try and do a vegetarian version of the soups, like, do you have to kind of adapt? You know, if you're using a vegetable broth instead of a chicken broth, how would you? Kind yeah. Of, what would you so, do for that? Yeah. So for the squash soup, it is. It, I mean, oh, it's ready actually. Um, give it a couple more minutes. So for the squash one, the recipe calls for a chicken stock, but there's no reason why you can't use a vegetable stock. And using a vegetable stock, same same equivalent, so 900 milliliters of stock wouldn't make a difference. So that's that would be completely, so it's gluten-free, it would be vegetarian. And then the one thing is you do add cream in the end, which is optional. Um, but because it's a, it's a curry-based squash soup, it's mildly curry. You could use coconut milk to make it lactose-free as well, right? So, I mean, that's an option. And honestly, it calls for um, half a cup of cream. I don't generally put that much in because in our house, we actually don't, we try and avoid uh, milk or lactose um so that's vegetarian it's not vegan it could be vegan but it's not and then for the potato leek one I mean that's difficult right because you have to well it's not difficult all you it already is but using a vegetable stock but you would have to omit the bacon and other other than that it would be fine and there's only three pieces of bacon in it so it's not gonna bacon doesn't make the soup love makes it <laughs> it's true that's what i say that's why soup like honestly like soup i don't know i mean i make soup all the time but it's just it's easy and you you can adapt it it doesn't matter it just it you can't i don't know jerry how you can mess up with soup I, i'm like actually I just, disheartened i'm wondering if whether my love is like weak dishwater and that's why i can't <laughs> <laughs> like I just I mean the nice thing is too is I would get I would do a weekend of making soup so I've got four pots on the go and I'm making like taco soup squash soup whatever whatever I've got um and then I just freeze it in single like in mason jars and then every day I go to lunch I just grab a mason jar and by the time lunch time comes around it's defrosted enough I can get it out of the jar put it in a bowl and heat it up so um my sister Donna so can attest to the fact that I mean like I always have soup and you know I constantly taking it to mom in fact this is going to someone in our church is gonna be the recipient of this because she uh, doesn't like to cook and she's on her own now so it's easy and it it's fulfilling I like to use um, bone broth in mine have you ever tried that yeah I have um I have used bone, I, but it's it's labor intensive, and I don't know. I haven't gone out and bought bones. I only well, use them I if do. I have them. Yeah. But you you roast them in the oven first, and then. No, I don't make the bone broth. Oh, okay. I, I just yes, yeah, I get it from the store. Mm. We have made uh, bone uh, broth before, like roasting it in the oven, and it was vegetables yeah. and tomato paste and all sorts of other things it's uh, to me it's a marvelous experience it's so great because like i so infrequently slow down and mm. uh, so for me it's like i'm cooking and so i can't leave it but i'm not really doing anything most of the time so it's like 
relaxing for me. I love doing it. Problem for me is by the time I'm done cooking bone broth for 48 hours, I can't stand the smell of it. You walk in your house and that's, that's all you smell. It's, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a big, I'm not a, yeah, big meat eater, so. I think the only time I ever attempted to make a brothy kind of thing was I, I saved up a bunch of shrimp shells and I tried to make uh, like a seafood broth. It was a disaster. So it sounds worse than what you had. Jerry. It was super <laughs> tasteless and all the time that we spent making it, it was just like totally worthless. Yeah. I don't think you're meant to make a fish broth from shells, are you? I think it's from fish, like real fish. Well, I it, it was an internet recipe. It was maybe it wasn't a fish per se, but it was something that you were supposed to use seafood shells somehow, and supposedly it would make something that was tasty. But yeah, it didn't mm. work. I'm getting advice from the uh, other occupant of our house, and it's white fish uh, bones only that you. Uh, yeah, no. it's probably why shells. You would taste like sand. Wouldn't it? I don't know. I guess I can't believe everything you, you find on the internet, huh? <laughs> really. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm just going to adjust my chair. <laughs> Stop me. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to finish off the squash suit. So it's all, the squash is soft. I mean, I might have, if I was on my own, let it cook a little bit longer, but it doesn't matter. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in the food processor and uh, once, actually I should, I'll do it now. Uh, so I'm going to add peanut butter to it and Worcestershire sauce. I'm going to blend it. I'm going to put it in a bowl and then after it's all blended together, then I'm going to add in uh, some whipping cream. But I'm going to mute because I'm sure you guys don't want to hear my blender and then I'll unmute when I'm done. So maybe you guys can find something to talk about while I'm doing this. I'm so fascinated, peanut butter. Wouldn't have thought to put that in. Yeah, we have so many allergies in our house um, that uh, we can't do that. But I recently made something that had sun butter, sunflower seed butter. Huh. And it was, it was actually a squash soup um, as well. And um, it was really, really good. It just creamed it up and gave it this different flavor. So like as well as cream, like did you add cream as well or just the, we, we just the, a, the soup well, butter? We have a vegan in the house. So, yeah. um, so uh, I think I used, um, I might've used either pretend yogurt, uh, like coconut yogurt or rice yogurt or uh, something creamy um, like that. I might've even used oat milk. I used something, but it wasn't dairy based. Yeah. We have to do a lot of adapting because of all the different food issues. <laughs> so, but it was the same idea and it was really good. Yeah. Peanut butter is a really great source of protein. And I would imagine those seed butters are as well. And most people have that in their house, right? So it's not a strange ingredient to uh, have yeah. to find. Well, and peanut butter also has, like, if we're looking at low cost stuff and, you know, people, things that people can get from, from food banks, peanut butter and chickpeas are pretty much like standards at those, at, at the food bank. So uh, it's good to have recipes that have those things in them. Yeah. Uh oh, Julie was looking around. <laughs> her lid. She's lost her lid, the top of her lid. <laughs> so, interesting story while I'm doing this. So my, I've had this, I probably got it when I got married 29 years ago. Um, there is no center plastic knob on it. So back, I had three kids in three years, had a nanny, and we did all our own baby food, and uh she had made it and I'm feeding my son and he's just not eating it. He's just not eating his fruit. So I took a taste. I guess the knob had gone into the blender and she continued to blend the food that we uh, uh, <laughs> I know, right? 
So every time I use this, and I use a dishcloth to cover the knob, I remember me making my son eat these peaches with ground up plastic in them from the knob. Yeah, she didn't last long. <laughs> anyway. Anyways, you can use an immersion blender, you can use a food processor, or you can use this. I have an immersion blender, but I just find I get so dirty when I use it. Like it, I don't know. This is just quicker in my mind, but it's what you're used to. I'm going to mute you or mute me. Mm -hmm. Garrett made a soup uh, last week out of pumpkin. Ooh. We had this pumpkin sitting on our porch for three or four weeks. So he brought the pumpkin in, washed it, and baked it in the oven. And then, you know, he put the usual things like onion and, and uh, olive oil and what have you in it. But it also had cardamom. And oh man, was it ever good soup. It was a vegan soup. Yeah, so very, very good. Yeah. And pumpkin like is cheap, right? Yeah. And mm. if, if you have a place, a cool place to keep it in your house, it can last for a long time, just like a squash can or those kinds of things. I don't know. Anybody? Yeah. Pumpkin's really good for your digestion, too. We make pumpkin? Often, like pureed pumpkin for the dog because he's got a bit of a sense oh. of stomach. So oh, yeah. if it works for him, it must work for us, too. Oh, yeah. Well, it's good to give to cats, too, if they have constipation. <laughs> no, diarrhea. Sorry, diarrhea. <laughs> get it right. I don't want to get those mixed up. Yeah, you don't want to give your cat pumpkin if it has that problem. <laughs> it's but I don't, think, I don't think pumpkin and squash are that different, are they? No, they're not. And they're high fiber. So they're good for animals, but they don't need a lot of it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Jan is saying she had a disaster once with hot soup in a blender that sprayed all over. Oh. And, uh, and that's something to keep in mind, too, because a friend of mine did that um, several months ago when we were allowed to have dinners at each other's houses. I guess it was last year. Um, she was cooking something and took did something with the lid of her blender, and it was a hot thing, and actually ended up burning herself so badly she had to... Oh go get it dressed at the hospital. So oh, oh, you have to yeah. watch that with hot soup. <laughs> so yeah, you're right, yeah. Jen. You're they, right. Do, they do suggest you let it sit before you blend it, but obviously they don't do Zoom soup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're almost done this one. That's why I like the immersion blender. I put the pot right in the sink. So mm. it's close to me. Yeah. My sink's small, so it probably wouldn't fit, but anyways. I, I mean, the nice thing is too, this soup, I don't, I don't think you guys are gonna be able to see it. I'll bring it over, but because it's my, my squash, um, it is so orange. Oh yeah. Like, like you, you probably can't tell, but yeah. it is, yeah. it is bright orange. So we've added the peanut butter, we've added everything that I could remember we needed to add except the cream. And you know what, I'm not going to add it because I think it's still too hot and I don't want it to curdle. Um, but basically what we would do at this point is just add it, the recipe calls for half a cup of whipping cream, I don't I put about a quarter of a cup in, but don't add it when it's really, really hot. Um, just simply because it may curdle and then you can season as you need it. But looks beautiful. That's it. that's it. Okay. So should I carry on with the potato leek? Sure. Looks beautiful. Yeah. All right. I'm just gonna move this out of the way so I don't spill it on the floor. Give this a rinse. Sometimes, sometimes if something calls for cream, we substitute it with um, yogurt, plain yogurt. Yep. Well, that's it. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of things we can use. Oh, yeah. Gives it another bite. Actually, we use yogurt a lot instead of sour cream. 
Yeah. I made a mistake once and used vanilla yogurt instead of. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't very good salad dressing. <laughs> Nowadays, that Greek yogurt is so available that, and it's so nice and thick that it's good for a lot of things. Yeah, I like, uh, yeah, we use it a lot. All right, next up. So, okay. really, it's just bacon, potatoes, and leeks. And leeks are a really rewarding vegetable to grow. Just in case you're looking for a hobby. Why, they grow, they're like 50 times the size of a green onion. Yeah. <laughs> Do they grow nicely or are they easy to grow? Oh, yeah. You put them in and then you pick them about five months later. Do you ever leave them in through the winter, Julie? I have. I have. But um, I supply... Cam Witherspoon and Jenny, oh, yeah, and, yeah. and then us with all the leaks, and they they don't last. They're gone. They yeah. don't. I mean, they do winter over, and we'll go down and use them for you know. I'll get them at Christmas time and that. But I I you know I'd rather I'd rather use them when they're fresh, fresh. Yeah. Uh, they just go hard. The core goes hard. Yeah. Um. They're getting yeah. ready. They're getting ready to shoot and produce seeds. Yeah, and I then made some, uh, some uh, pickled uh, leeks once for um, sandwiches. Oh, they were so good! It really made the sandwich worth eating. And I also not very great at making sandwiches either for some reason. Sandwich, salad, and soup. Mm -mm. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean leeks. I recently again. Influenced by the British side, uh, did, we did. I made creamed leeks, which I had never done before. And they were really good, and that's a pretty instant gratification because they take about less than five minutes to make, but they really can make a roast dinner. Like they, they're the difference between like a four point five and a five out of five. <laughs> they are lovely. Bit fattening, but whatever. Do you grow your leeks from seed? Uh, no, I do not. Because you can get like a hundred plants for five bucks. Oh. I'm going to talk to you in the spring. <laughs> oh, you know what I got today? I'll go get it. In a minute, I'll go get them. I got Bonnie Henry uh, Cosmos. Um, oh. seeds from West Coast Seeds. So it's a fundraiser for the food bank can for Canada Food Bank. And 100% of the proceeds from the sale of the Cosmo seeds and just go to um, Canada Food Bank. So they'll be split across all the provinces. So if anybody wants some, I ordered quite a few. And then there's like 500 and something seeds, I think in each pack. I'm just going to mute you while I uh, blend. Did you say buying Henry seeds? Yeah. Oh, she's got shoes and seeds and <laughs> I know. Does Bonnie Henry grow a garden or did somebody make them into her name? Sounds like the latter. Oh, okay. It's wow. uh it's a fundraiser by West Coast Seeds. Oh, okay. And so they named it Bonnie Henry. And they even have I'll get I'll get I'll get them and then I'll show you. They even have her picture on them. Oh, oh and it's, it's and and it's and it says it's a circle around her and it says be calm so b e e oh yeah yeah because they're pollinators right the flowers yeah, is yeah. cosmos so they're Aww. and and the nice thing about these seeds is they hate good soil mm. right so they thrive in malnourished drought soil so like anybody could grow them oh i should get some of those <laughs> that would be well, Shocking. They're sold. <laughs> yeah, no, they're sold out. But the thing oh. is, I bought. Um, they're sold out right now. They'll get more. Um, but I bought too many. Um, and then, and then, oops. And then notice there's like I think there's like between five and seven hundred in each package. So I have like oh. a, a couple thousand. <laughs> is that you laughing, Donna Marie? 
I think it was. Anyways. Oh, I didn't mute you. Sorry. Yeah, it's actually not that loud. <clears throat> so both of these soups will thicken up. So it's just a matter of like, this one's almost like a stew. But um, to this one, again, I would add about I think that the measurement was, uh, I don't know, it was from the UK, so it was all done in, in milliliters, but um, I wouldn't, I'd probably add like a quarter of a cup. It look, kind of looks like pea soup, but it tastes way better than pea soup. Oh, but, yeah. but again, I would add about a quarter of a cup of uh, whipping cream to this. Actually, it calls for single cream. That's right, it calls for half a cup of single cream, so which is like a, like a half and half. But because I've got whipping cream that I'm using here, I'll use it and I'll use about a quarter of a cup. And then for this one, they suggest that you serve it with crispy, um, with bacon, crispy bacon on top. So that's just a finisher. So, so, that, oh yeah. So let me get the other one. My very orange, guess what we're having for dinner tonight? <laughs> Soup and grilled cheese sandwiches. Anyways, there they are. Awesome. With hey, that, hey, with the... <laughs> well done. Yeah, thank you. So, any questions, anyone? Like I said, they they both freeze. They freeze remarkably well. I freeze all my soup and mason jars, and as long as it's not too thin of a bra, I've never uh, ever had it break on me. Hmm. They both look delicious. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so, Julie, if you were going to um, get, uh, like, I don't grow potatoes, but I might go to the farmer's market and get some local ones, could you store them in water and to prevent them from going brown, or do they just go brown? Uh, well, in the summer, absolutely 100% not. So what I did, because I had a conference call before <laughs> this call, so what I did is I put them in a pot. I... Um, put ice in the pot and I heavily salted them. Okay. They just, they just don't, they just oxidize like in the summer. I, I mean, for that reason, if I'm planning ahead and I'm having, you know, company over for dinner, I don't use my potatoes. Mm -hmm. But they're they, so much more delicious. No, like, no, they, they are, but yeah. they don't keep. Yeah. They just don't once they're peeled and out of the, like, yeah. Cause I mean, I don't even store mine in the fridge, right? They're just in my garage. But they just, it just takes a lot. I mean, you just have to be careful. So the other thing I'll do is if I do like a, like a partial baked potato, then I'll, I'll boil them, I'll oil them, and then they'll keep so I can get them half ready. And then it's just a matter of baking them. But raw, nope. What's wrong with brown potatoes? Well, they just don't look good. Oh. I mean, in soup, you wouldn't be able to tell, but I mean, I just don't know if it's a degradation of the, of the vegetable or if it's just brown because it's oxidized. I just, yeah. it comes down to looks, I guess. We're a bit spoiled, right? We like everything to yeah. be pretty. Real, real, real food doesn't look the same as artificial food. It's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> 